Hello and welcome back. So what I want to talk to you about today is transmission lines. Structures built under various geometries whose sole purpose is to take signals from one point to another. Now since this is a really complex subject, today I only want to look at ideal transmission lines and the main parameters that describe their behavior. So propagation delay and characteristic impedance. So if you're curious about what these parameters mean, how they influence the behavior in the circuit and how to simulate them using LTSpice, then keep watching. So to start things off, a transmission line can be either a trace on a PCB, it can be coax cable or twisted pair cable or any sort of cable really, but it's only called a transmission line if a condition is met. If you're transmitting a sine wave, you need to have the period of the signal less than 10 or 20 times the transmission delay of the cable, or if you're talking about digital square waves, you need to have a rise or fall time, which is less than four times the transmission delay of your structure. So what is transmission delay? Well, I got a little experiment going on just to show you. So what I have here is a signal coming from the signal generator. It's a 10 megahertz sine wave. It's passing from my first channel. It goes at the moment through roughly 50 centimeters of coax cable and it reaches the second channel and I also have a termination resistor. I'll get to that in a moment. And what we can see is that both channels are seeing roughly the same signal. There's only a very small delay that, I mean, you can call it measurement error or anything, but it's basically the same thing on both channels. Now, if I increase the length of the cable, say I remove my 50 centimeter cable and put in a one meter cable, we see that we start to have a very clear delay between the two signals. So right now it's at around 4 nanoseconds. So what if we increase the length of the cable a bit more? Well for that I have this 3 meter cable to try out. And now we definitely see a delay going on. And this time it's around 12 point something nanoseconds. One of the fundamental things to understand when talking about currents and electrical signals flowing through conductors is that they have a certain speed at which they can go. So you don't have instantaneously current going from point A to point B, but rather there's a time delay in between the two events. And that's exactly what we're measuring here. It takes the sine wave 12.6 nanoseconds to travel through three meters of cable to reach my second channel of the oscilloscope. So it's not an instantaneous phenomenon, but rather it's time dependent. Now, transmission delay will happen regardless of the length of the trace or the type of signal that you're trying to pass through it. It's just that in most cases you can simply ignore it. Now there's one important thing to mention regarding propagation delay, so which is the transmission delay for a set unit of length, and that is that this is not a constant. It will be different for different cables and it's based on the dielectric properties of the material surrounding your conductor. So for example, for a cable in vacuum, it will be the speed of light. For a cable surrounded by anything else, it will be slightly lower. So if we look at the datasheet of the cable that I was just using, so in my experiment, I was using an RJ59-U type of cable. And here in its electrical characteristics, we can see that, first of all, we have a nominal velocity of propagation defined in percentages. So this is how many percent out of light speed is the propagation speed. In this case, it's 82%. And we also have it as a nominal delay in nanoseconds per feet. Now, why they're not using meters is beyond me, but that's a different story. Now, for different environments, like for example, traces on a PCB, this propagation delay is usually calculated based on the dielectric properties of the PCB. And one important thing to mention is that the propagation delay will be different for traces on the outer layers of a PCB compared to traces on inner layers because of the quantity of dielectric surrounding the trace. Now, I don't want to go into too many details on this, but I found this really nice website in which they explain how this propagation delay can be calculated for a PCB. 
and they also give some values in picoseconds per inch. Again, they're not using centimeters or meters. And for different dielectric materials. Now, the second parameter to consider when talking about transmission lines is characteristic impedance. Now, the characteristic impedance of a transmission line is defined as the ratio of voltage to current that appears when a signal is applied to a transmission line for the duration for which the signal doesn't really reach the end of the line, so during the transmission delay. So for that period, regardless of what is at the end of the line, the line acts like a load to the signal generator equal to the characteristic impedance. Now, for an ideal transmission line, the characteristic impedance is the square root of the inductance of a length of wire divided by the capacitance of a length of wire. So a transmission line, just like any other wire, has both inductance and capacitance. And you can model a transmission line by creating a series of inductors and capacitors. So just like we have here. So what I got here is a signal generator going into a model of a transmission line. So we have a bunch of series inductors and parallel capacitors. And if we run this thing, we see our input pulse. And if we look throughout our line, and we zoom in a bit just to see things a bit more clear, we see that at consecutive points, our input signal seems to be delayed. So to get the signal going through the transmission line, you need to charge up all these capacitors, but all the inductors before them are opposing the flow of charges. So to get the signal down the line, you need to spend a bit of time to get the signal through all the components. Now you can actually build a delay line in this form, but the point is that this sort of structure applies a constant load onto the generator even before the signal actually reaches the end. So you can see that even though there's absolutely no current going through the output load, there's already current being consumed by the line. And this is how the impedance of the line is acting on the generator to draw energy. Now, the significance of the characteristic impedance becomes obvious when we look at what happens if we don't really care about it. So what happens when you interconnect two transmission lines of different characteristic impedances, or when you connect a transmission line to a load that has a different impedance compared to the transmission line's impedance? Let me show you an experiment. So what I got here is the same setup as before. I have my signal generator connected to the first channel, then I have three meters of cable connected to the second channel, and there's a matching impedance. So I have my 75 ohm coax cable terminated with a 75 ohm termination resistor. And at the moment I'm using a square wave, or at least as square as the generator can generate it. And we can see that we do see our delay, so that didn't change. But the interesting part happens when I remove the termination. So when I leave the cable terminated only with the one megaohm of the oscilloscope. And well, we see that our square wave doesn't look so happy anymore. So we have an overshoot, we have ringing, it's completely ruined. And basically, this is what happens when a transmission line isn't correctly terminated. You end up having reflections that show up as ringing in the signal. So to get a better understanding of the phenomenon, let's look at this in a simulation. So, to model a transmission line in LT Spice, you don't have to go with the inductor capacitor model, you actually have a dedicated model for this already built into the program. So if you want an ideal transmission line, you have this T-line component. And it has two parameters, a transmission delay and the characteristic impedance. Nothing else really matters, because all other parameters can be deduced from these core values. And basically, what I got here is the setup that we started off with. So I have my pulse generator generating a 2 MHz signal. I don't really know its exact output impedance, but around 30 ohms seems to reproduce the results quite accurately. Then I have my transmission line, which has a 75 ohm impedance and a transmission delay of 15 nanoseconds. I added my oscilloscope termination, but also the 75 ohm termination that I added on top of the cable. So if we run this thing and we look at the signal coming out of the 
signal generator and also the one arriving at the other end, we see our transmission delay to 50 nanoseconds and everything looks just fine. So just like we've seen it in our measurement. Now, if I remove my termination and we look at what happens at the end of the line and compare it to the beginning of the line, we see our oscillations appearing and we see that at the beginning of the transmission line they're slightly offset. So in the simulation we can see this a bit more clear than in our measurement. That's because the simulation has much clearer resolution, basically. And one of the interesting things that we can notice is that the signal at the end of the line is shifted by about the transmission delay from the signal at the beginning of the line. So it's almost as the two things were the same thing, just shifted by the transmission delay. So to get a better understanding of what's going on, we need to look at the signal as an electromagnetic wave rather than as purely a signal. So when a wave passes from one environment to a different environment, in this case from one characteristic impedance to a different impedance, part of the wave will tend to bounce back. So whenever you have a mismatch in impedances, your incident wave will split into a reflected wave and to a transmitted wave. And these three voltages are linked. So we can say that our transmitted voltage is the sum of the incident voltage and the reflected voltage and the ratio between the reflected voltage and the incident voltage is called the reflection coefficient and can be determined based on the impedances of the two environments and we have a few extreme cases we can look at so when the two impedances are exactly the same so a 75 ohm line terminating into a 75 ohm resistor we have no reflections so our reflected voltage is zero and our incident and transmitted voltages are equal, so all of the energy that was in the incident wave completely transferred into the load, so transfer was perfect and efficient, and this is the ideal case that we would like to have. On the other hand, if our second impedance is very very large, in extreme cases it's infinite, so the transmission line is open-ended, we end up having our reflected voltage equal to our incident voltage, and that means that our transmitted voltage is two times the incident voltage. So we end up having our overshoot. Even though we started off with a one volt signal, we can end up having an extreme voltage of two volts. And our last extreme case is when the end of the line is short circuited, so the second impedance is zero. In this case, our transmitted voltage is zero because, well, it's a short circuit. And our reflected voltage is the inverse of the incident voltage. So that's how we end up having both overshoot, so when we hit a very large impedance, and undershoot when we hit a very low impedance, both compared to the exact impedance of the line. So basically based on how well the two impedances are matched, so between two lines or between a line and the load, we can work out how much of the energy from the line actually gets transferred into the load. If there's a mismatch, then the signal will bounce back and we will have inefficient energy transmission. Or if you're working with small signals, then you will have reflections in the line. So to make sure that we clearly understood this whole reflection business, I got this final simulation prepared. So what I got here is a pulse source that has a 30 ohm output impedance. I have a transmission line that's split up into two pieces. So there's two 12.5 nanosecond delay elements, both 75 ohms. The reason for splitting the line up is just so we can see exactly what's going on in the middle of the line, not just at the ends. And then it's terminated with a very large 1 mega ohm impedance. Now I also had to add these extra 100 mega ohm resistors, just because LT Spice was considering these nodes as floating, so it didn't really like that. So let's simulate and see what happens. So if we look at the beginning, we see our 0 to 1 volt pulse, but just at the beginning of the transmission line, we only have 0.7, and this is because we have a voltage divider built with our 30 ohm output impedance of the pulse source and the 75 ohms of the transmission line. So we see that the transmission line here is acting as a load. Now, if we look into the middle of the line, we see that roughly 12.5 nanoseconds later, our pulse appears, so we have the delayed period. And if we go now to the end of the line, we see that our signal went from the 75 ohms of the transmission line into a very large impedance. So because there's a mismatch in the impedances, it's reflecting. 
And since the mismatch is with a very large impedance, the reflected voltage is almost equal to the incident voltage. So the total transmitted voltage, the voltage that we're seeing at the end of the line, is basically double that of the signal that we're supposed to be seeing. In this case, roughly 1.4. Now if we go back down the line, we look at what's happening at the middle of the line, we see our reflected voltage, which is a positive value, adding on top of our incident voltage. So we see the step going up also to 1.4, and then when we reach the start of the line again, we go from the 75 ohms of the line to a much lower resistance, so 30 ohms. So in this case, the reflected wave is negative rather than positive. So the voltage that we're seeing transmitted at the start of the line is smaller than the voltage that we had in the middle of the line. So we see that at the start of the line, we no longer have the 1.4 volts, but rather a roughly 1.1 volt. Now, if we go back, through the line to look at what happens to this negative reflected voltage, we see that in the middle of the line, the negative signal now subtracts voltage from the voltage existing there, so we have this step going down. And finally, when we reach the end of the line, again, we're going from the line impedance to a larger impedance, so the reflected signal, which is negative at this point, will double, so we have a double decrease in the voltage. So we drop down to roughly 0.8. And then the signal starts traveling back down the line. So because of this mismatch in impedance, this transition front that we had at the beginning will reverberate back and forth through the line until it slowly stabilizes. So in this case, we have roughly 250 nanoseconds, which is not enough for this reverberation to slow down. And now one of the interesting things that we will notice so if I just look at the signal at the end of the line, we see that it's periodic and its period is almost exactly 100 nanoseconds. Or in other words, it's four times the transmission delay of the complete line. So here we had a 25 nanosecond transmission line and to get one of these complete oscillations, the signal has to go back and forth four times. Now this is an important observation because if you have any sort of noise on a digital line, you can measure its exact period, and if it has any sort of relation to the transmission delay of that line, then you can be sure that the cause of the noise is from this sort of impedance mismatching. So all in all, it's important to know that depending on the frequency of your signal or how sharp it transitions, traces on your board or in your circuit may need to be treated as transmission lines or may not need to be treated as such. And if you do need to treat them as a transmission line, then you need to take into account all of these impedance factors. Now, there's a lot more to say on the topic, of course, but that's for a different time. For now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and see you next time. Bye bye.